I wasn't going to do a Good Deeds Legacy 3, but there's always something left out, and this one was pretty important. The bottom line of all of this is that you go through life with various handicaps that life throws at you. But for all that, you're really a product of what you choose to know. Granted, the more handicapped you are, physically or otherwise, that's going to set boundaries on what you can know. At the same time, we're talking about God's plan for your life. We're talking about the relationship with God you can have, and there are no barriers there. Because God can cause you to know. In other words, your IQ doesn't matter. He can just flat cause you to know. Your age is not a factor. You're the linguistic barriers. There's nobody who dies without having more than enough chance to believe in Christ. And your first reason why you know that for sure is that God can just flat cause you to know the gospel. I mean... You know, that would make sense and that would be fair. Christ died for all sins, so it's paid for. I mean, the bottom line is, if you, let's pretend that you were a basket weaver in Peru and that you were, you know, um, blind, so you did it by feel. Let's say that you were deaf, so you couldn't hear anybody. And you were dumb, so you couldn't talk. But you could feel the weaving of a basket, and that happened to be your talent. So God gave you a talent by which you could do something and feel, you know, not feel quite so ashamed. Alright? So here you are weaving baskets in Peru. You can feel things, but you can't see, touch, taste. I mean, you can taste, and you can touch. That's it. So how is the gospel going to get to you? You can't hear anybody give it. Okay, but God knows how to give it to you. He's not hampered by those limitations. He can just flat cause you to know. You're going to have X number of thoughts in your brain. Obviously, some of those thoughts are going to turn to, how come I'm like this? You know, you're going to there's going to be a yearning for a God. It's native to the human condition to want a savior. So you're going to have thoughts about that. Well, God doesn't know in advance what those thoughts are going to be, when they're going to occur, and he can't make other thoughts. You know, God throws thoughts into people too. He communicates. He causes things to occur to your mind. That's John 14:26. Oh, you think he only does it for unbelievers? I mean, for believers? No. Nobody could even get the remotest idea that there was any validity to God's existence if he didn't witness to it. When you feel a certainty about God, part of that reason is because he's witnessing to the fact that it's true. Now, he doesn't need sight. He doesn't need hearing. He can just give you the thought. All right, so here you are, you're basket weaving. You can't see, you can't hear, you can't talk. But you're going to have thoughts about wanting to be saved. And you might even be thinking of it very narrowly in terms of, you know, being aware that you can't see or hear or talk. Okay, and he can send straight to your soul thoughts in reply to that so that you can still know God exists. He can send the entire Bible to your head if he wanted to. And why wouldn't that be a fair thing? I mean, granted, you you know, there's lots of ramifications here. He gives you too much information before you're ready for it. Then he's coerced your volition. He gives you too little, he's also coerced your volition. 
But nobody knows better than God who made you. What's the right amount? And nobody cares more than he does to make sure you get the information you need when you're ready for it, when you want it. He's not going to force feed you. Okay, so what Legacy 3 means, and I've been saying this in a lot of different ways, you get what you want from God. What you want from God today, tomorrow, the next day, in eternity, future. Every moment, and you don't necessarily, you don't know this, and you don't mean it to work like this, but this is how it works. Every moment, you and I, and I'm, I'm just as much a part of this as you, this isn't like a preachy thing. Whenever I make my audios or videos, okay, they first apply to me. Because I don't know who's going to hear it, if it's anybody. So we, every decision we make, moment by moment, is a vote on some level about what kind of relationship we're going to have with God today. Tomorrow, the next day, forever. That's the first characteristic of our decisions. They affect us. My soul is constantly changing in light of the decisions I make. The decisions I make are based on the information I think I have. Okay, but the information I think I have is colored by what I believe about it. I never have total information. It's never 100% accurate. Okay? I mean, the Bible's accurate. Okay, but my understanding of it isn't. Some of it is accurate, some of it is not. Constant, ongoing change. I can look at the same verse ten times and get ten different things out of it. When I look at John 3.16 now, I see it very differently than when I looked at it 30 years ago. I've changed since then, so I see it differently. It's the same words in the same verse. But I see it differently. See the point? My relationship to God also has changed since 30 years ago. So I made decisions that I didn't really understand were going to impact the way they have. But they have. So this third part of Good Deeds Legacy is simply, what do you want your relationship to God to be? Now that gets in the heart of how you define what a relationship ought to be. And that's where it gets scariest. Because unbeknownst to you and me, I know that every single decision, every word I'm speaking is going to have some impact on me today, tomorrow, the next day, forever. Well, but I don't know all the ramifications. I don't know how this is impacting me. I'm sort of blind, like the basket weaver. All I know is I want a relationship with God. And I want it to be deeper, which is part of the reason why I make these audios. I'm trying to work through a lot of the concepts. And for me, that means I have to talk. And then if you listen, then God's doing something for you that's different. I'm not part of that. I'm just the spoon used as the, I don't know, the venue for it. But for me, I'm trying to think like before God right now and talk. Everything I think is having an effect on my free future forever. That's the most important thing to get out of this. Okay, so how do I define relationship right now? A lot of people define relationships with other people, and therefore God, based on goodies, based on attraction, based on good deeds. And, and you you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to a certain extent. Windows 8 is a terrible program. It really is. 
Okay. So I don't want Windows. So I don't want to have a relationship with Windows. Why? Because it functions badly. So it does what I consider to be a lot of bad deeds. And, you know, assuming that I'm right about that and I've gone to some trouble to do my homework because I had to decide what to buy and what not to buy. Assuming that that's true, at least in my situation, then I'm saying no to a relationship based on what? Bad deeds. So how are we going to, I mean, at the very heart of the question about relationships, it necessarily revolves around good deeds. Okay, but the flip side of that is that when you're talking about absolute relationships, like husband, wife, parents, kids, God to humans, humans to God, there is a layer there that has to be completely independent of good deeds. To the extent that layer is not present, then we are electing the deeds rather than the person. It's one thing to say no to Windows because it performs badly. It's quite another thing to say no to your spouse or your kids because they're performing badly. And especially, of course, to say no to God. It's, I mean, you know, here you got to put perform badly in quotes. In our definition, his performance is not what we want. And so we call it bad. We all have glitches in absolute relationships. And I call them absolute because your spouse is your spouse. Yeah, you can get divorced, but the fact remains that you got married the first time. I mean, you know, first, in other words, to that person. You got married to that person, and afterwards you're divorced, but you're not never married. So the marriage always will exist. It terminates, but it still has an existence that has ramifications that go on forever. Same thing with kids. You have kids. They will always be your kids. You can disown them. They can disown you. You can never see each other again. But the fact remains, they are still your kids. Same with God. He made you. He is your God, whether you want him to be or not. And you can say, no, I don't want you to be my God. But he still is. You just don't have, you just got this barrier as far as the functioning of the relationship is concerned. Okay, so if we're voting for good deeds as the criterion for establishing or continuing relationships, we're putting a price on those relationships. Okay, if we're putting a price on the relationships we have to others, then we're saying the price is what matters not the relationship you see what I'm saying yeah we'll have a relationship so long as the price is met okay then there's no grace if there's no grace there's no love I have to keep harping on this love what we call love is not love it's attraction it's I'm getting what I want from this person this thing so I say I love it. That's not love. And certainly not God's love. The closest thing in the human race we know to love, we call it unconditional, where despite how bad your kid acts, you still love him. You'll still do for him. You still want the best for him. You might even... Um, you might even break off, you know, contact, but you'll still think about that person and you'll still care about that person. Okay? So, excuse me. I just had a problem with my arm. Um, the point is, is that you'll, you'll cut off the person in terms of activity, but your soul doesn't cut them off. 
all right? And you will be looking for an excuse to get out of the separation. That's love, all right? Real love. Real love begins where need ends. You don't need the person to make you feel good. You don't need the person to be a certain way. You just plain love them and that's all there is to it. Now, a lot of us have had situations where we've encountered love like this. And of course, it's not the same scale as God's. But we always sort of scratch our head. What does she see in him? He treats her badly. She keeps loving him anyway. Yaddy, yaddy. All right. So it's got that character to it. It's not necessarily an integrity in us. It is an integrity in God. The point I'm trying to make here is that this whole business of priced relationship is what's the heart of the trial with Satan. Satan is saying that, that relationships ought to be priced. God's saying that they ought to be without, okay, without price. That's Isaiah 55. And that's his love is absolute. You do not have to be a good person. You do not have to do good deeds for him to love you. Okay, if you if you do good or you are good, well, of course, you know, that might be attractive, but that's not why he loves you. He just does love you, period, or he wouldn't be here. So this third part of the legacy is that while that is his attitude toward you, your attitude about what relationship to him should be is really being crafted decision by decision that you make while you're down here. And if you're making lots of decisions to do good deeds, then you're basically telling God that you want your eternal relationship with him to be based on good deeds. So it will be. Now think about that. Would you want your relationship to your spouse, assuming you're married, would you want it to be based on good deeds? Would you want your relationship to your kids to be based on good deeds? And to a certain extent, even your employer, would you want your relationship to your employer to be based on good deeds? Uh, with the employer situation, it's going to kind of have to be to a certain extent. But you'd also wish that your employer had a certain amount of, what do you want to call it, empathy? Empathy, sympathy. You'd want a certain amount of, of flexibility there so that if you had trouble, your employer would still care about you. I mean, unfortunately, in today's America, we legislate so much that you can't really tell if your employer cares about you because the employer is required to do so many things all right that that basically takes the fun out of caring about somebody same thing with our welfare system it ruins it welfare ruins grace welfare ruins the idea in a relationship that you give it makes it all forced and so that's why people you know get so legalistic about it and it ruins it for both the subject and the object. You're paying taxes so that somebody can eat. Okay, and that on the surface sounds pretty nice. Except that you don't know who's getting it. You don't get a choice as to who gets it. Because it's just forced on you. you got to pay these taxes and somebody else you don't know is feeding somebody you might not even want them to be fed. You want to have the right to determine that. Yeah, and that was God's system in the Old Testament. You got to pick what you wanted to do. There was a very minimal, every third year there was a collection for the poor that was part of the tax. It was very de minimis. Any other giving you did, you know, that was up to you. 
And people survived on charity for thousands of years. That was the norm. They didn't have government programs like we do today. You know, all the programs we got today are pretty much a legacy of communism. Marx and Lenin and all that other nonsense. Marx really more because that's a, you know, mid-19th century concept. It's not like it had never been there before, but it was, you know, that's what made it popular in our day. So, do you want your relationship with God or your spouse or your family to be based on good deeds? Wouldn't you rather have the relationship be based more on something beyond that? So you don't have to be little Miss Goody Two-Shoes or little Lord Fauntleroy all the time? Does a guy who's rich want somebody to love him only for his money? I don't think so. Does a girl want a guy to love her only because she's pretty? I don't think so. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. Price love is no love at all. So when you go about doing good deeds in the name of being a good Christian, you're basically broadcasting to your own soul first and to the world that love ought to be priced. And that God, His love, is priced. And you can say until you're blue in the face that God just loves you, God loves you, whoever you are, and your actions belie your works. Because if God loves you irrespective of how good you are, and we all know He does, He says so many times, then He doesn't care if you do good deeds. He doesn't need your good deeds for anything at all, period. So if you're busy trying to do good deeds and telling other people they ought to do good deeds in order to be a good Christian, then you're basically telling everybody that God is just like the woman who marries a guy for his money or the guy who only likes a girl so long as she's pretty and that family doesn't mean anything and that marriage doesn't mean anything and that all relationships should be prized just like Satan claims. Where did Satan claim that? At the end of at the beginning of Job one and at the beginning of Job two. Does does Job love God for nothing? Satan's accusing God of bribing Job. And Satan tried to do the same thing to Christ in the three temptations of Matthew four. Those are all temptations to do good deeds in the name of love should be based on good deeds. The idea being that Christ was going hungry and that God was unfair and that Christ was unfair for not turning the stones into bread which could have fed both himself and the world. So how much does God love the world if he won't turn the stones into bread? Same thing with jumping off the temple second temptation. Oh, you're not going to jump off the second off the temple here? Well, don't you care if people believe in you or not? See, if you jump, they believe because then you show them you're God. But if you don't do that, then you must not love them. See, God's supposed to do pet tricks. And God's supposed to expect pet tricks. Third temptation, politics. Well, what's that but a bunch of pet tricks? Everybody angling with everybody else, trying to say how good they are. We're better than these other guys. We do more good deeds than those other guys. Vote for us because we do all these good deeds. We're going to give you all these good things if we get in office. Hello? So think real hard about the legacy that you want for yourself. If you're sitting around, running around, doing all these good deeds, you're slapping God in the face, saying that He ought to value you, and you ought to value Him as a priced object. I do for you, you do for me. And that that kind of pettiness 
is somehow holy. And here's the problem. Since you get whatever you want from God, and you're picking that as your wants, that's what you'll get in heaven. So ask yourself again, is this good deeds mentality the way you want to live in heaven forever? With that as the boundary of your relationship with God? Because that's what you're telling God you want that relationship to be? Peace out.